Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members uh, may consult tablets during the course of the meeting. Um, that is because we provide papers in digital format. Um, agenda item one today uh, is to consider whether to take items three, four and five on today's agenda in private, as well as to consider whether to consider our work programme in private at a future meeting. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. And we move on to item two, um, which is an oral evidence session on our inquiry into the flexibility and autonomy of local government in Scotland. We have one panel this morning consisting of the leaders of the opposition parties from a cross-section of councils. I'd like to welcome the panel, Councillor Mac Roberts, leader of the Scottish Conservative Group on Perth and Kinross Council, Councillor Steve Burgess, leader of the Scottish Greens in the City of Edinburgh Council, uh, Councillor Susan Aitken, leader of the SNP Group on Glasgow City Council, and Councillor Peter McNamara, leader of the Scottish Labour Party on North Ayrshire Council. Welcome, and would any of you like to make any opening remarks? No, in which case we'll move straight on to, to questioning. Um, one of the things that uh, some members of the committee have done is uh, gone uh, to Germany, Sweden and Denmark to look at local government and how it operates in these countries. Uh, and obviously they have a, a constitutional standing there and various other legal frameworks um, to show uh, the positioning of local government within the governance uh, of these countries. Can I ask you, do you think it would be helpful if there was a constitutional place uh, for local government? Obviously, we have the Concor Concor Concordat, which has uh, dealt with some matters, but we're, we're interested in what you think about a constitutional place. Can we maybe start with Councillor Burgess? Yes, um, thank you, convener, and, and thanks to the committee for, for inviting me to give evidence um, um, to you um, uh, this morning. Um, yes, as you, as you say, um, in many other European countries, um, the, the place of uh, local government is protected and enshrined um, within the constitution uh, of that country. Um, I do feel that that would be uh, a useful uh, um, thing to happen um, <clears throat> for local government in Scotland and um, of course if uh, there is uh, Scotland becomes an independent country in uh, following the referendum and there is the proposal to have a constitution that might provide an opportunity uh, for local government to be enshrined in, in a new constitution I feel it's important uh, because it would give local government um, a standing on its own um, in, in the eyes of uh, the people and the public. Um, it wouldn't be at the behest of the central government to um, change or abolish um, that uh, standing. And um, along with the existence of local government in the constitution, you could also enshrine some of the uh, responsibilities of, of local government as well, not only its existence. So. Uh, and, and that, I understand, is the case in, in other European countries at the moment. So, yes, I think that would be a, a welcome move. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me along here today to give my opinion on these, these questions. Uh, constitution, well, we don't have a constitution, so it's very difficult to enshrine local government in, in a constitutional format. I, I personally think the flexi flexibility is all and the ability of being able to change things more easily without uh, being bound by constitution. It is the way forward. You, Councillor McNamara, please. Um, I would slightly disagree with that. And what I honestly believe that um, in all the time that I have been involved in local government, there has been a discussion about parity of esteem. And it's about the parity of esteem that I am uh, keen on because, uh, like the previous speaker, Councillor Steve uh, Burgess, I do believe that it should be enshrined in the Constitution in order to protect it but also to give it its place in society, in Scottish society. So uh, I am very keen that we have a protection, if you like, within the Constitution. And the other part that you make about protecting the activities of local government is another crucial part of uh, what we would be looking for. Um, certainly, I have a fear of a centralising agenda, no matter who the party is. And uh, the, the talk at the minute is centralising, for example, education. 
Now, I have a real fear that that could happen, and unless and until we get it protected in local government, then that is something that uh, is something that we should all be uh, extremely concerned about. <clears throat> yes, I would uh, largely agree with, with what Councillor Burgess said and, and much of what Councillor McNamara said. I would absolutely, in the event that we have a constitution in Scotland, um, I think it would be absolutely right to have uh, local government enshrined in that constitution um, in the same way that, that Councillor Burgess described. Uh, I think that uh, in, in terms of um, the uh, powers... Uh, it's obviously that's a discussion for uh, whatever method we come up with uh, for across Scotland for for devising a constitution. Um, I would, um, I think, flexibility has to be there. The the the, the way forward in local government um, from the Christie's Commission and and just generally the view is is partnership. Um, so powers that we enshrine for local government, we should be aware, uh, may be powers that are shared uh, with other organisations and other bodies in the future. But in terms of the, the status, uh, the, the parity of esteem, as Councillor McNamara said, and the, the, uh, the, just the, the place of local government in Scottish society, I think that would be an extremely useful thing. Uh, and perhaps it's... Uh, it's its biggest impact would be um, in, in the kind of confidence of local government, if you like. Uh, there's perhaps always inevitably going to be a certain amount of tension between central government and local government, regardless of the party political uh, setup at any, at any one time. But uh, having the, the, the confidence and, and uh, the, the um, assuredness of a constitutional position would allow local government perhaps to relax a little bit and uh, maybe um, innovate more within within that uh, context, knowing that it has that protection. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very useful. Um, we've heard just talk about parity of esteem. Um, Councillor Burgess, I think, talked about the standing in the eyes of the public. And Councillor Aitken, I think you mentioned place. Um, one of the things which, uh, of course, uh, uh, is, this, is the situation in, in European countries is much, much higher turnouts for local government elections. Um, do you think that that parity of esteem, that place, the standing of the, uh, in the eyes of the public actually helps uh, get those higher turnouts uh, in these other countries? Councillor McNamara, do you want to start this time, please? I couldn't honestly answer whether there would be a greater turnout uh, uh, in, a, in an election, but in my experience, uh, the, the electorate, when I go to the electorate, have, how can I put this, the understanding of the workings of local government is not widely understood. And I don't know whether that is because people either don't care or they don't uh, understand the power of uh, local government until they need something. And that's when they start to stand up and shout at local government whenever there's a, a difficulty. But it's never when something goes well, for example, litter collection and the streets aren't dirty anymore and people... So whether that would make people come out and uh, vote, I couldn't honestly say. What would make people come out and vote, though, is if there was an understanding that it had protection that there was a greater understanding of uh, the work that councils do, and I don't think we do enough to educate and to inform the electorate of the work that we do. We try very hard, certainly in, in North Ayrshire, but it's whether uh, people view it as a powerful organisation, i.e. that if they don't get what they want, they will go to the next higher level, for example, your MSP or your MP. And it's, it's that parity of esteem that I'm looking for. Once you gain that, and once people understand where the council is in the scheme of things, then I think they would be much more likely to participate in voting for the individual in their particular area to protect the facilities and the services that they get. Thank you. Sir Roberts, please. Thank you. Well, first I'd just like to say you legislate the steam, you have to earn it. Um, secondly, when your question about turnouts in European local elections, well, I think I only know the French system and it's far low, it, it operates at a far lower level than our current system. And I think the, the thing there is that people know who the mayor is. People know who, the, who, who his councillors are. Whereas our local authorities, many people do not know who their local councillor is. They don't even know who the, who the provost is. So I, I think if you, if you get down to an ideal, there must be an ideal size of a unit, at which point people 
feel more involved in, in, in the locality, they know the people involved, and therefore they're prepared to turn out and vote for them in a local election. And these elections are hard fought, I know that. Thank you. Councillor Burgess, please. Um, <coughs> thanks, convener. Um, yes, um, in, in Edinburgh, as in other parts of Scotland, you know, we, we have experienced low voter turnouts. The last local government um, election in Edinburgh saw a turnout just under 40%, um, uh, a wee bit higher than the rest of the country, but it's still very low. And, um, and worryingly, uh, across different polling districts, it can vary as much from 7% turnout to 60% turnout. So clearly people are um, choosing not to uh, take part in, in the elections. I would agree that, um, at least to some extent, esteem has to be earned. And I think in Edinburgh we've had our challenges about maintaining the esteem for local government with some very challenging issues um, recently, including um, the tram and shared repair service. and. You know, the council uh, is obviously working to rebuild um, its uh, esteem with, um, uh, with local people over those. Um, I think uh, the uh, a constitutional uh, enshrining local government in the constitution, I think, would help raise the esteem. But I think um, fundamentally um, to address people's um, uh, willingness to uh, take part in local government election. You really need to make local government uh, um, uh, relate to people's lives and they need to feel that local government is making decisions and has um, power, including over raising local taxes, um, that affects their, their lives. So whilst the constitutional um, uh, enshrinement might be important. I think there are other things which we'll probably get to later in the in the discussion um, that would would help with you know the uh, with low turnout and low engagement um, with the council. Thank you, Councillor Aitken, please. I don't think constitution um, in and of itself uh, will uh, directly improve turnout. And um, I think, as, as, as other witnesses have said, there's a much wider range of issues at stake uh, to do with political engagement generally and to do with the esteem with which politicians are held, uh, regardless of, of which level they're elected at. Um, I think, though, that the, where the constitution uh, could have an impact is in this issue of um, exactly what, what Councillor Burgess was saying there about engagement um, and about directly uh, empowering uh, communities and citizens and neighbourhoods. Um, and it comes back to this question of um, a constitutional protection giving local authorities, both local government as a, as a body and individual local authorities, uh, the confidence in their own status to then uh, start to devolve their own power down and, and start to uh, empower their uh, electors and, the, and their communities much more. Um, and if, if they feel that they are not threatened uh, and, and if local government feels that its status isn't threatened, then uh, it, it can uh, perhaps um, start to let go some of its power a little bit more and stop thinking about um, ceding power, but think more about sharing power uh, with the people who actually elect it directly. And that, I think, will be uh, where we need to, uh, to make the difference in order to start to raise turnout and raise political engagement generally, is, uh, is to make people feel involved and, and give people that direct involvement and, and um, empower them to be involved. Sir McNamara, you want to come back up? I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And um, the way that you do gain esteem is if the local elected representative is seen to be working within the community, not just dictating to it. And the, one of the things that we have enacted within uh, our area is uh, locality planning, whereby an area is selected or they ask to be selected. And all of the services that should be working in that area, for example, police, social work, community workers, wardens, uh, the housing department, uh, cleansing, all of that come together to address the issues within that locality. But crucial to that is the elected representative to be working, not directing, but actually on the ground working within the area to be seen and to be taking up the issues that have been raised. That way, if they are seen to be hard-working locally elected representatives, their esteem will rise. 
and the, the, uh, the community will then understand much better the activities of local government, where they need to go to get a problem solved, how they can get it solved. But most crucially, that local community is empowered. The, the work of the, the local uh, community is taking the council forward, not the other way about. And for me, that is crucial to the future of local government, that we have to empower local communities. And in order to do that, we need uh, um, uh, more resources to go in. And that's just my first bid for some resources. Okay. We're probably going to talk about many of these things as we go along. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, first of all, please. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you mentioned the turnout in local elections. Do you think the, multi, the advent of multi-ward council, councils has had any impact on the, turn, on the turnout? And would you all be in favour of keeping the system? Uh, we'll start with Councillor Aitken. Uh, yes, definitely. And I think uh, the, the advent of PR in local government is probably the best thing to happen to local government in Scotland for a very long time. And it's, it's, uh, it, it, there's no doubt that it's completely opened up uh, our democracy um, at local level. Um, and and uh, uh, any sort of return to um, a, a, a ward... A, a, um, well, the way it used to be, the kind of uh, the, the unrepresentative political way, I think, would be a, a real step backwards for for local government in Scotland. Um, certainly, just speaking from my own point of view, um, to get a wee bit parochial, um, my, the own my the ward that I represent is a three member ward, and the three councillors are all from different parties. And uh, I think that works very well, and it works to the benefit of the ward. Uh, we at, um, have, um, and I know that other councils have similar sort of setups, area partnership. Uh, committees, uh, which um, we, we meet with with members of the community and also people from um, the local police, for example, uh, local housing association, local minority ethnic uh, forum, those those kinds of organisations, and make decisions primarily around uh, small grants, but also on things like the local police strategy. And the fact that there are three of us uh, who are elected members, directly elected members, um, from different political backgrounds with different perspectives, but working together very much in the interests of the neighbourhood and not working on a party political basis in that context, although we might do in other parts of the council and other committees, is positively advantageous. I think it's, it's better for, for local communities. Um, the, the trick is, to, um, is to, to expand and extend that uh, the way that we've 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 started, uh, and it is it's at its very early stages in, in Glasgow certainly that we've started to bring the community into direct decision making um, about where funding's allocated, about how strategies are implemented at at very local level. Um, that the trick is is to start to expand that working, um, and and that's where you start to have the impact on turnout. I think. How, how have you done that? Through community councils or it's, what? Yes, community councils. Uh, it's, it's through the community planning process. Right. Um, so it's, it's the, the sort of lowest level of the community planning process in Glasgow, mm -hmm. um, if you like, is, is at ward level. Um, and it's, so there are, there are representatives from each community council. And uh, in my own ward, uh, the, where there are um, three community councils represented, we also have other community organisations and, and community representatives. That doesn't work everywhere, of course, because there are some parts of the city where uh, there aren't active community councils, where there's a real dearth of community councils. Um, it, it so happens that I represent a, a fairly affluent ward where people are fairly active, the community councils are, are quite engaged, so it does work well for us. It doesn't necessarily replicate everywhere else, and there's still a big job to do. So I would say that the, uh, the single transferable vote system had no impact whatsoever on turnout. It made it neither better nor worse. But uh, I would say it's also the way forward. I wouldn't like to see it changed. I think uh, in my ward there's three councillors, there's three of us, and we all work together, all from different parties, and that certainly works. You have to work for your community. As Councillor McNamara says, you dictate your community at your peril. Indeed. Um, working with communities is difficult. It's, good for, it's easy for councillors because they know their patch. But it's very difficult getting groups of people together, except on single issues. Uh, it's very difficult to get a group of community councillors. There are community councillors in, all, in every single community in my ward, but I know in parts of Perth there are none. So who do you consult with there? It, it, it is difficult. Burgess. 
Yes. Um, I would agree that um, the introduction of the, the proportional representation STV election didn't have an effect on voter turnout, but that first election was coupled with a Scottish Parliament election, so it's probably hard to separate the two. The, the most recent council election, which uh, was a standalone council election, saw um, a, a reduction in voter turnout, but there's no evidence that that is to do with proportional representation. I would argue, actually, that um, uh, without proportional representation, the turnout might have been actually lower. Um, people have, have got more choice, clearly, um, to uh, elect... Um, councillors who represent their views under a PR system and uh, and have councillors uh, who represent their views um, act for them and act in, in the council. And uh, so I think that's been very healthy um, uh, <coughs> in uh, a number of councillors. Now, my own party uh, is represented either by single members or small, small groups. And so we have been able to um, represent people in the community who uh, share the similar political views to ours. Um, residents, uh, because of PR, they now have a choice about who they come to within a ward. Um, indeed, they can come to one councillor or several at a time and set us off against each other. Um, in my own ward, uh, we actually work, um, we've got four parties represented, but we actually work very uh, collaboratively uh, on issues that are um, uh, uh, of, of concern to the community and, and to individuals. These are largely, uh, the people aren't concerned about party polit political issues, they're concerned about delivery of services and so on. And those are things that local councillors can, can work together on. And indeed, um, we, we also have, uh, we have a neighbourhood partnership model uh, in the council that brings together representatives of the community councils and councillors and the voluntary organisations and the police together. Um, to form a neighbourhood partnership um, covering a couple of wards um, or so. Um, those have been interesting. Um, uh, what I would say um, is that uh, the, uh, the level of uh, with what's tried to do is to uh, devolve down some spending to these uh, um, neighbourhood partnerships. And I think that's very key um, in, in terms of getting people uh, interested in, in, in local government and so on. But I would say that that spending is still probably 0.1% of the council budget uh, only. So uh, there are decisions about environment uh, projects, um, roads and community grants that are devolved down to these neighbourhood partnerships. But I don't think it's reached the level at which the general wider community have, have seen the value of that. Um, and it's the neighbourhood partnerships are still probably only engaging a, a very limited number of um, people in the community. The only point I would uh, like to make is that it's, it's not simply down to ward level that we work, it's down to street level. There are maybe half a dozen streets that we could get together. Uh, and the big issue for my community and the, what I've seen is a change in their attitude and a respect for the individuals who are doing, creating or providing the services. For example, there is a change of emphasis and attitude towards the police because the police are no longer them. They are now part of the community and the police have changed because the, I do recall a very first meeting I had with the local constabulary and they said, look, Peter, I'm not a social worker. I'm a policeman. I arrest people. I lock them up. Well, that has changed because they now understand the community they are there to serve, and they now understand the difficulties of those communities an awful lot better than they did before. Now, for me, that has changed uh, not only the attitude of the residents, who, by, uh, it's not community councils, they set up their own groups. I, for example, have set up about six, seven tenants, residence groups, uh, and one chairman of which, who had never chaired a meeting before in their life, she stood against me in the council. Now, I welcome that because that meant she had learned and was growing and developing, and that's what it's all about. It's about empowering people, uh, and not simply at a ward level. I have to say, though, that at a ward level, you're absolutely right. If they don't get the answer from me, they go to somebody else, and they say, Peter McNamara said this, and you have that conflict at times, whether you like it or not. But I have to say that the three members that I have worked with, I've got a four-member ward, all different parties, all recognise that uh, ultimately we have to work together, because if we don't, then the, the person who suffers is the community, and that is a bad reflection in all of us, so we don't do that. 
Amrit? If STV isn't the answer to better turnout in local elections, what, in your opinion, is going to help better turnout in local elections? Why don't you go through it, Councillor McNamara? Clearly, from what I've been saying to you, my uh, understanding would be that once people are empowered, once they understand the power they have, they're more likely to exercise that right to vote. And I said right at the outset, I do believe that communities don't fully appreciate the work and the services that uh, councillors uh, do on their behalf, but they also don't understand the power that they have to influence those, power, uh, those people. Uh, when I joined the council, I was a telephone engineer, and I joined because I was in a volunteer trade union. I stood politically to win the award. Uh, ultimately, I became so immersed in my community, I forgot about the politics. In fact, I've been disciplined by the <laughs> Labour Party. But it's down to uh, uh, empowering people for me. And it's not about me doing it. It's about giving people the opportunity to do it for themselves. And I think that's the most important part. And thank you very much for that. Um, Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, uh, Kim Gunnar. Um, just <clears throat> kind of following on to, from that line of questioning, um, do you think the, the size and the structure uh, of, uh, of the local authorities that we have in Scotland are correct, or would you amend them? Okay, can we start with Councillor Roberts, please? And I, I think I may have uh, misread a signal from you earlier, so if you want to add anything to what was asked previously, please feel free to do so. <coughs> well, I, I, I was just going to say that I, I feel that uh, if we want to revitalise local government at the lowest level, I think we should fund, we should give um, community councils budgets to, to operate services directly in their locality, grass cutting, uh, dog warden service, play parks, etc. And I would think if we did that, we might find all these these, these local uh, these uh, community councils which are currently in abeyance would start up again because they would have the power to deliver services that people really really worry about a lot. They, they come to me a lot about these sort of small, relatively small issues, and I think that would that would be a start in in, in, in getting people really involved in local government. Okay. Can I ask what is to stop councils doing that right at this moment in time? I don't know why we don't do it. Okay. I think we should. Councillor Burgess? Um, yes, just... Um, I, mean, in, I think s size is, is very important in terms of encouraging voter turnout because if people feel that decisions are being made um, that affect them in their local area, they're more likely to be engaged and interested in that. Um, and it, it, it's... Um, we, we had a, we've had a report done, um, our party had a report done by um, land reform campaigner Andy Whiteman. I think the committee's aware of that report, of renewing local democracy in Scotland. But in that report showed the, a, a very clear correlation between voter turnout and, and the size of local government. And as uh, local government has contracted uh, in Scotland and been consolidated, so turnout has, has, has lowered as well. Uh, whereas in, in other countries where local government is smaller and closer to the people, people are more uh, engaged and motivated to take part in the local government. So um, Andy Whiteman's paper suggests a, a figure of about 20,000 per uh, municipality um, that could be um, empowered to make decisions on a local level. Um, but uh, our party hasn't um, formally discussed any, um, you know, specific sizes. But it's obviously a much. I think the size of local government units now in Scotland are about um, 170,000 each, something like that. Um, and his recommendation is 20. So see that, uh, and uh, that that's a, a huge difference in in the size of the unit. Um, so I think. You know, that, um, that's your question, much, much smaller would bring people in. They'd actually be taking part. You'd have many more people actually representing their local areas. It wouldn't just be councillors. You'd have many more people who are actually representatives, and uh, um, that would increase uh, participation itself. Um, and I know there's lots of evidence about the, uh, and, and uh, I'd read some of Andy Whiteman's report as well, um, and I know that some of your previous witnesses to this committee have, have, have talked about that evidence, that uh, the smaller the size of local government, uh, uh, the more 
um, people are inclined to engage with it uh, electorally and um, just day to day. And I know that's the, the kind of um, the, the evidence from other countries, but I would say that I, I do think that we can do a lot more with what we've got just now. I think the, the structures that we have uh, currently may well not be perfect, but we have tools and we have the ability within those structures and it's up to individual councils to use them um, and to have the will to, to themselves devolve and, and embrace subsidiarity. Um, Glasgow is probably... Um, the most kind of classic example of where this needs to happen. It is a very big council, and most individual citizens in Glasgow will see the council as a monolith, which doesn't actually bear very much relation to them in their neighbourhoods or their streets um, and their day-to-day -day lives. And so, of course, there's going to be a lack of engagement when, when that's the, the perception, and to a large extent, the reality. Um, Glasgow has, has started... Uh, to talk about things like community budgeting. It has started to use the community planning process. Um, it's starting to talk about its, its following Edinburgh's lead um, in, in trying to be a cooperative council, again, um, at very early stages. There are a lot of things um, that are possible. At the moment, I would say they're, they're far from embraced as much as they should be, but the possibilities are there. Um, I think the community planning um, structures, uh, the, the community empowerment bill when it comes uh, will give us um, a, a great deal of scope to think about how we actually do these things. And I also think there's, there's other things going on in terms of policy, which... Uh, Conversely, some people might have characterised them as centralisation, but they actually give us opportunities for, uh, for, for subsidiarity and for, for um, local empowerment and local involvement, like um, having the Scottish Police Force, for example. I would say that, in actual fact, the, um, the direct... Uh, engagement and involvement with the police uh, in, in my ward is now greatly improved and that the, the, the um, impact, the input uh, that, you know, albeit at the moment a fairly a very small group of citizens, uh, but the input that they have into a very, very local policing plan um, is, is enhanced uh, from, from the way it was previously. I think health and social care integration um, gives, gives a similar um, kind of uh, opportunities and similar kind of scope. Um, at the moment, uh, the area partnerships that I talked about in Glasgow, the, in terms of budgeting, all they really have just now is, is um, relatively small grants. But the opportunities for them, uh, with perhaps an expanded membership, to look at, for example, the health and social care budget for the award, particularly perhaps around health improvement uh, and, and public health issues, I think are absolutely myriad. And bringing health and social care together in a, um, an integrated structure gives, gives us the opportunities to do that. Um, and again, I think one of your previous witnesses, um, I think it might have been um, Professor Mitchell, had, had said that we need to stop thinking that, someone, that the only people who are entitled or who um, have the, the right to make decisions at local level are, are those who've been directly elected because the reality is that our communities are absolutely full of people who um, are incredibly engaged, who know their communities, who know what is, what is necessary for um, improving ordinary people's lives. And we need to have um, we need to have the courage and we need to have the will to give them the ability to make decisions about their neighbourhoods. Thank you, Councillor McNamara, please. There's a lot of there. I, I, I have to disagree with the police part of it <laughs> because um, I, I didn't know that 220 odd officers are walking about with guns and there is no democratic control over that. So if that is a real concern for me. Um, but uh, in saying that, I think the engagement with our local community started before the centralisation of uh, the police service. I think they were well engaged in my community and have been for, for some time, as I've already pointed out. But I would not advocate changing local government again. I, I come through the last change and I do not wish to go through that again. Uh, apart from waste of money, I think you're absolutely right. There are tools already available to us to work within our communities. But we also have pieces of legislation, for example, asset transfer, uh, the community empowerment bill, these are tools that we could be using to enhance the lives of our, the, the, the communities we seek to represent, and we shouldn't be afraid of them. I have to say that there are some councillors who said to me, and I'll quote, they said to me, um, to create a residence group, you're only creating a stick to beat yourself with. And that is a modern-day thought. 
And it's a frightening thought because if there are councillors out there who think that by engaging with the community is somehow creating a stick to beat yourself with, then why, goodness sake, why are they standing for election in the first place? So I, I actually believe we should be engaging with much more with community, and I think we do have the tools to do it. But for goodness sake, let's not start changing local government again. Hello. Councillor also wanted in as well. Sorry, could I just make a comment? Yeah. Service and it, it's centralisation. Again, it's centralisation. Um, most of the, the, the crime that, that certainly, certainly affects people in my locality, and it's a rural, very low crime la uh, area, it is, is minor crime, antisocial behaviour, things like that. Now, we have community safety wardens. We have traffic wardens. We may end up eventually, possibly, taking the, the, the European model where they have different types of police fo forces. You have a central service that deals with major crime, and you might have a local police service as well, which deals with minor crime. That would give, that would give people a better chance to, 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 to feel that they, they are more in control and councils would be more in control of minor crime. Before I take Mr McMillan back in, um, one of the things which I'm interested in, obviously for, for many areas, it's the first time that there have been ward policing plans. Can I ask you, is it the first time for, for your own area to have ward policing plans and have they gone down well with the public? Obviously, Councillor Aitken has covered that to a degree. But is it, Councillor Roberts, is it, is it a new thing, ward policing plans in Perth and Kinross? Police locally have always worked well with us. Um, they attend community council meetings, and I think, to be honest, that's the best thing that they actually do, that they become a local presence, they sit there, they take notes, and they report on crime in the area, which is, frankly, almost non-existent. But I think that, that contributes a lot. But the, the, the major problem I find, and I think people do find in the community, is the constant changing of the police presence. You just get used to one senior officer or even one local officer, and he's changed. But, but was there ward policing plans previously in, in yes. Perth and Kinross? There were. Councillor McNamara? Ward policing plans, uh, yes, they're a, a fairly new initiative. I, I, I'm a convener of a community justice authority, so I, I remember the introduction of them. But as I say, uh, Stephen Howes introduced community, uh, sorry, warden uh, um, community policing, and I welcome it. My fear is that um, we, do, we, we no longer have control over how that is implemented. And if somebody changes, for example, Stephen House goes and somebody else comes in and says the priority is no longer community policing, what control do I have over that? What community control do we have over that? And I would suggest that we would have none. Uh, and so the ward, and the, we do have ward policing plans, but it fits in with our locality planning, which is down to street level, not simply down to the ward. In, in terms of what you've already said, Councillor Aitken, do you think that... Um, uh, the, the public themselves have more say uh, over policing in their areas with the implementation of ward policing plans and I take it from what you've said Glasgow didn't have that previously um, they, they had relatively local policing plans but they were on um, they, they, were, they weren't down to a single ward area um, the for example, in my area, it was previously, it was two wards which were side by side, but it so happens that the neighbouring ward to mine uh, is considerably bigger and has a very different kind of um, criminal justice needs and, and local issues. Um, and it dominated uh, in terms of the local policing plan. So the, 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 the difference uh, between moving even from, from two wards down to one ward has been significant. And yes, I, I do think that there is, um, there is more input uh, and I, I think there is, there is more engagement. I would say the, um, our community sergeant um, has, uh, we've had him, uh, maybe we're just lucky, but we've had a consistent presence from him, certainly, albeit in the relatively short time that I've been a councillor. Um, and uh, he is now a member of the area partnership. He wasn't before, he would just be an attender. So there is, di there is direct uh, discussion. He's not simply presenting a plan uh, to the, the members of the community councils and, and the other organisations who sit at that partnership anymore. Uh, the whole partnership is sitting down and drawing up that plan um, and, and deciding what the priorities should be. So that's, that's the real difference there. And I think, I think it's a significant difference, actually. Yes, yes um, well, neighbourhood policing isn't, uh, isn't new to Edinburgh. Um, and uh, the, the city's been you know, developing... 
um, ways of working directly with the police. I think there have been some concerns that with um, the advent of Police Scotland that, that um, the community focus may have been um, diluted. There are still community um, plans in place. Um, and Edinburgh actually also directly funds um, 44 community police um, <clears throat> and they have their own performance indicators um, which the police uh, are to report back to the, to the council on <clears throat> um, uh, the, um, that the duties of these uh, police um, uh, cover. Um, I wonder can we, can, if it would be possible to just go back to the question that you, you said about what's to stop local government doing it now because I think yep. it's just a very... Yep. Maybe an important point. My understanding is, <clears throat> in Edinburgh, when we moved to try to devolve down some spending to neighbourhood partnerships, um, that um, the, the councillors had to be involved in those neighbourhood partnerships in order to give, to sanction or approve the spending of those neighbourhood partnerships. Now, I'm not absolutely clear on this, but I think there may be a legal impediment to councils just devolving down spending to local level um, to community councils or whatever the uh, a new what that legal impediment was. No, I'm not absolutely clear. I'm, I'm sorry, just an impression that I have, but I just wanted to flag that up because um, <clears throat> you know if it's uh, if 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 uh, if it's important that we do devolve down and there is a barrier, then maybe that has to be addressed. If, if there is a barrier and we find a barrier, then uh, we will certainly look at that. Um, but I think one of the things which we have been uh, finding um, is, you know, um, where there is the possibility of uh, devolution of budgeting, um, it seems that folks say that there are difficulties, but yet, yet we've yet to find somebody who say, has been able to say what that difficulty actually is. Um, sorry, Mr McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Um, so, uh, one of the other the points that has came up, um, not just certainly with this particular piece of work, but certainly with other uh, strands of work that this committee has undertaken, uh, has been the issue of, obviously, uh, of powers for local authorities. Uh, and we have heard evidence certainly uh, in this particular inquiry in terms of uh, trying to obtain more powers for local authorities, for more powers to be devolved to local authorities. Now, if that actually uh, were to be the case, um, one of the, the, the issues that we certainly have faced is that there really has been kind of uh, uh, not any concrete proposals uh, for what the local authorities would actually do with A, with additional powers, but B, with the additional financial autonomy. Uh, and I'm just uh, I'm keen to try to kind of obviously A, get your opinions uh, on that because uh, there is a, a bit of a gap there in terms of the evidence that we've received going through this particular inquiry. McNamara, do you want to go first on that one? Thanks, uh, um, <laughs> um, can I say it goes back to what we were talking about earlier? I am more keen to be using the powers we have at the minute better rather than seek more powers. Because what you're talking about, it goes back to your earlier question, it's about um, changing local government again. And I think we've, we're only just through a change in local government. I think we're still coming to terms with the powers that we have. My fear is that some of them are being centralised. And I think that's what I'm suggesting to you. Uh, possibly local government hasn't demonstrated uh, properly uh, uh, the the way that it can use its powers at the minute. So I think what I'm starting off by saying right at the outset, I want to protect what we've got. I would like to see it in the constitution and I would like to see us demonstrate to our local communities the use of those powers an awful lot better than we have to date. Yes, I think that, that adds. Um, in, in, we're already gaining powers in some ways through some of the, the, um, the policy direction that's coming about. And I'd come back to health and social care integration. Uh, while um, that, uh, the, the new health and social care partnerships will obviously mean that uh, local government shares its responsibility for adult social care services with um, the, the NHS board, in return, um, the NHS board will share its responsibility for primary care services with, with local government. Um, so that those creation of those partnerships actually uh, gives uh, local authorities oversight um, and direct democratic oversight over um, areas of, of the health service that it didn't have previously. Um, so, so 
you know, it's it's not a one way street in terms of uh, the, the 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 thing around centralisation, which is um, I think it's something we, we we get too hung up on sometimes. Uh, without wanting to, you know, suggest that it's all right to to um, consistently chip away at, at local government. As I think I mentioned earlier, the way forward is thinking about partnership. Um, so we should always be thinking about where power is best shared, uh, that we think of that as sharing rather than, than having power removed or, 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 or ceding power. Um, because if that's what delivers the best outcomes, then, then that's, that's what we should, we should be up for. Um, uh, can I pose one quick question is on mm. the partnerships? Um, do you think that, uh, that the sharing uh, agenda and the partnership approach uh, is actually uh, the best method to empower local communities? I, I think it's a, at, at the kind of um, the high level partnerships, like the whole health and social care partnerships, I think there is an, um, plenty of flexibility there to allow uh, health and social care partnerships in, for, an, for example, an area like Glasgow, to then use that structure uh, to go down and, and have neighbourhood partnerships, for example, if that's what they choose to do. And I would hope that that, that will happen uh, once that, that process of, of, of setting up those partnerships um, has kind of been completed and gone, gone through its, its cycle, if you like. Um, thinking about, uh, yeah, absolutely, on a, at a more local level, uh, at a neighbourhood level, yes, that's, that's how we should be thinking. If we think in the spirit of partnership all the time, if we think of partnership with third sector organisations, partnership with um, housing providers, uh, with, with tenants organisations, with residents associations, with community councils, with all the myriad of, of um, local organisations uh, that exist, um, then uh, you know, in, in my own uh, ward, for example, there's a um, there are a number of kind of community projects there that are setting up community gardens and urban crofts and things like that. There's all sorts of really interesting things going on there. If we think as a council that we are working in partnership with those people, then yes, that's the right route to start to empower them and empower other. Uh, citizens who are not necessarily directly involved in organisations, who are not necessarily members of things, but who see the difference that those organisations make in their own street and in their own communities. Yes, that, that is a route to empowerment. And um, I would say that's the mindset that, that we should be getting ourselves into um, if we're serious about, about empowering communities and then, as a result, increasing engagement, increasing turnout and all the other things that... You know, it, it takes us, it's a virtuous circle, if you like. Um, it takes us back to the question in the beginning of the session. Yes, please. Um, yes, thanks. Um, I think it, it is the case that um, the powers of local authorities have been eroded. Um, previously had control over water and sewerage and further education. And um, most recently, the police has been taken away from local authorities. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, local authorities have um, had some new powers. And... Um, uh, one of those is power over um, local energy supplies, and we're very keen um, to promote that uh, in Edinburgh. We proposed a, um, an energy services company um, for Edinburgh, which would have the ability to reduce costs and, and uh, generate revenue for the council. Um, but I think um, key for me is fiscal powers for the, for the local authority. And uh, in Edinburgh, like other local authorities, you know, 70% uh, of our funding comes directly from central government, 20% through the council tax, uh, and 10% through, now 10% through fees and charges. But of course, the council tax element um, most recently has been frozen by central government. And uh, certainly in my party, we're quite critical of that approach because we feel that um, that um, it removes uh, the ability of local government to, of course, fund itself and, and for the people to make decisions about uh, how the council tax should be set. Um, <clears throat> but also, um, uh, um, so it has a funding impact, but it also has an impact on how people perceive local government and, and their part in uh, determining you know, who governs them and how they govern them financially. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, at the moment, it wouldn't be possible for my party to make a proposal at a, in a manifesto at an election to increase council tax by X percent to invest in 
uh, services or infrastructure in our city. Um, Why is that impossible for you to do that? <coughs> well, uh, um, of course, you know, technically we could raise council tax, but um, the, the finance minister has made it clear to councils that if they were to do that, they would lose an element of their block funding. So for Edinburgh, uh, at the moment, that would be not about £9.5 million pounds we would lose in the, in the grant from central government. This would mean we would have to increase council tax by so much um, that we'd actually uh, lose most of the money uh, that we got by the increase in council tax. It's in possible for any party to go in a manifesto to say that they were going to raise council tax? Practically, politically, it's, it wouldn't be possible to do that. Okay. But, um, but just, just just to say, um, so I think the, the, the power to vary council tax um, is key, but there's, there are also other fiscal uh, powers that lo local government could have um, and are presently denied. And um, we have direct experience of that in Edinburgh um, when uh, the uh, transient visitor levy was proposed. Um, uh, there was cross-party support for that, but when we went to central government to ask uh, uh, about the feasibility of that, we were told we didn't have the power to do it, and what's more, they weren't about to give us the power to do it. Um, so there are other financial um, mechanisms that are currently blocked um, to councils. And uh, so in terms of fiscal powers, um, I think it's key that, uh, as in other um, countries, local government has um, control over a good proportion, um, and I know that 50% has been talked about, of um, the money that it raises. And, and that would, um, we think, that would, would pull in people to see the importance of local government um, over, their, over their lives, over their finances. And also, local government, if it raised 50% of its income, it would be far more responsible um, you know, for seeing that that money was spent, you know, wisely, because people would hold them very much more to account about that. Can I ask you, in terms of um, <coughs> central government blocking you from um, bringing in the hotel bed tax, which can you define central government there for us? Um, and no, it was Fergus Ewing actually um, who, who uh, I think made statement. Although I think the finance minister did say something about it as well. Um, but um, statements were made in Parliament in answer to parliamentary questions. Um, and I, I wasn't party myself to negotiations that happened between the council administration and, and the government, but um, I'm assured by the um, existing uh, coalition that they did make representation to the government about it and, and were, were turned down. Um, I, I can, I'm happy to, I, I do have more detail on who said what about it um, in government. We'll look at that and any other information you can provide would be useful. Um, in evidence um, to this committee, um, Hugh Dunn, who I think is your um, Director of Finance at Edinburgh, um, said the public generally, generally do not look at how much comes from government grant how much comes from what used to be non-domestic rates and how much comes from council tax. They just look at the quantum, so generally we show total resources that the council has. Do you agree with Mr Dunn or do you think... Sorry, what, the, last, the last bit of... Um, the, the last um, sentence is they just look at the quantum, so gen generally we show the total resources that the council has. Generally, we show the... Uh, yeah, we were talking about the accounts. But, you know, basically he was saying that the public are not really interested um, in where the money comes from. They're just interested in the total. Do you agree with that? In the total. I think the public are probably most um, interested in, in what hits them in the pocket. And, um, and, and the council tax, you know, is one of those things. And obviously the council tax freeze has been very popular um, you know, people are very glad their council tax hasn't risen. But, you know, there is, a, there is a, uh, another aspect to that, which is that um, if, for example, in Edinburgh we had been able to, to raise council tax just by inflation over the period of the freeze, we would have had something in the order of £210 million extra to invest in uh, local infrastructure and, and services. And 
Right now, the Council is, I think, has a £50 million hole in its infrastructure investment, including £25 million in schools. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's a very raw issue and very a pertinent issue, I think. Um, you could also argue that if you um, raise taxation at this time, you may, may actually put more folk um, into a situation where they actually need to use the resources. Um, but, you know, um, I'm playing devil's advocate here in some regards. Councillor Roberts. For local authorities. We've lost police, we've lost fire, and I think there's a fear that education might be next. So rather than be worrying about getting more powers, I think the worry is hanging on to the ones that we have. Um, I, but I don't think we should get too hung up on lines. You know, you lose that, there's a line, it's gone, and you have no influence. We're now working, in the, uh, as Councillor Aitken said, the Health and Social Care Partnership. Now, are we ceding powers there or are we gaining them? Are we gaining something from the National Health Service? Or are they gaining from us? Well, there's no clear division there anymore. We're working with others. So we're not ceding powers, we're not gaining powers. I don't think we should worry too much about that. Um, as far as infrastructure costs go, I can't just, I'd like to mention that. We can, you can borrow from the Public Works Loan Board for infrastructure. Um, it's only really revenue you should be worrying about when we, when we talk about um, council tax. But uh, as far as powers go, which ones would well, we, which we, which ones would Perth and Canross like to have? Which additional powers? Well, I don't think there's any at the moment. We have got a huge amount of questions still to go through. I've got lots of members, so if we keep the questions very brief now and the answers brief as well, folks, so we can get as much in as we possibly can, I'd be grateful. Mark McDonald, please. Yeah, there's been some chat about the engagement with communities and. Um, to, well, one of the things which I'm struck by is that there seems to be an awful lot of talking going on, but how much is that talking actually influencing the decisions that the councillor are then taking? Because if all communities are getting is a nice chat with their local councillors, but then the council administration are taking actions which the communities don't feel involved with or empowered within, um, does that not mean essentially that communities aren't really involved or engaged, they just get to have a nice chat with their local councillors? Sir Roberts first, please. Well, I think that it is very difficult. I work with communities, I work with my ward, as do my other two, two colleagues. And it is difficult getting communities together for anything rather than one-off, building a new church or a new football pitch. Um, you, you, you can get people together to work on that basis. But whenever the project is finished, they go. So if you're going to be working with communities, it, it is difficult. Working with community councils is the only permanent structure that's there that we can work with. Others come and go. Um, but maybe that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, but I think, I think in my ward, certainly it's a very prosperous ward, where people, they just expect the services to be like, like Tesco's. They go in, if they need a tin of beans, they've got Tesco's, they go wherever it is, and they buy the tin of beans, they get it and they go away. They don't personally, you know, they don't want to be involved with Tesco's buying policies or worrying about where the tin of beans comes from. And I think they just they just expect the services to be delivered, and and th that's basically what we do. But we do try to work with communities, and on single issues, very successful. Mr. McNamara, please. I would disagree with that. I, I think it's very easy to work with communities if you put your mind to it, and it's not just simply about sitting down and having a chat with your local councillor. Um, as I've been trying to explain to you, it's about empowering that community. Uh, a couple of streets came to me, something like 120, 140 houses, uh, predominantly young families and uh, a mixture of uh, slightly older ones. But the problem was that they were having uh, trouble with vandalism, uh, graffiti, etc. So I called a meeting in the local hall. Some 70 to 80 percent of the residents turned up. We got the police along. But we most importantly, we set up a residence group. And we tackled not just the policing issue. It turned out it was two young people in the street were causing problems. That was resolved. The graffiti was removed. We then looked at street lighting, pavements, roads, the back gardens, fenced them off. Uh, roofs were done, windows were done. All of the other ancillary problems that were facing that community faced were dealt with. Now, it wasn't dealt with overnight. It's patience that has to be. What all that community wanted to know was that they were actually in the plan that the, community, the council were putting together. And in fact, they influenced that plan. That's the most important thing. But for me, the real story was that one old woman was out in her garden and her next door neighbour started to speak to her. And they engaged with each other, not simply with the councillor or the, the, the police. 
the important thing was that community, uh, as I say at these meetings, you know, Coronation Street's got a lot to answer for. You know, you go in and you shut the curtains and you, you don't communicate with your next door neighbour. That's the big problem. But what they do is, and still do, they still meet. That's seven years later. That's not just having a wee chat. That's actually caring about your community. Uh, and I've done that in several areas in my ward, uh, and it's been copied. Uh, but it takes a lot of hard work on behalf of both the community and the council. Um, I think it's a very mixed picture. Uh, there's, there's definitely. Um, I mean, I could, I could cite uh, examples uh, of the kind of thing that Councillor McNamara is talking about, where genuine difference has been made uh, by engagement at local level and and at, um, at, at absolute neighbourhood level, not just ward, but. Um, Undoubtedly, I think there is a gulf between uh, what is being talked about uh, in terms of um, community involvement, community engagement um, through the community planning process and what is actually happening. Now, that's partly because it's, it's relatively early, for uh, certainly for Glasgow and I'm sure for a lot of other councils, they're really just starting to get to grips with these ideas in a lot of cases, things like community budgeting, for example. Um, and it hasn't got to the point where... Uh, people um, on the ground will start to, to feel the impact of it and feel the engagement. But there's also an issue about one part, and, and I can only really speak for Glasgow on this, I suppose, but one part of the council talking about these things and having, I think, genuinely good aspirations uh, to involve communities, while another part perhaps does the rather old-fashioned uh, way of going about um, imposing changes on people. Uh, very often those are communities of interest, uh, you might call, rather than geographical communities. So um, a, a particular group of service users in Glasgow, I would say, um, older people and people with learning disabilities uh, and their carers have, have been uh, particular issues recently and have had a, a whole number of problems where uh, the, the, the way of going about changing services and uh, reconfiguring services, which is something we all recognise is necessary, particularly um, in the current financial climate. But nonetheless, it's been pursued in such a way that it's enormously alienated people um, and there's been a real loss of confidence and trust. So, um, yeah, there is definitely, there's still a gulf between aspirations um, in some parts of the council and those being carried through to be in a, a, a culture um, that, that the entire local authority is signed up to of genuine engagement and genuine involvement. Um, we're still quite a long way from achieving that. Sir Burgess, please. Yes, thanks. Um, <clears throat> my, uh, my group within the council are very keen on um, the issue of participation and we recognise that it's not uh, where it should be. Um, the people survey that they do in Edinburgh every year, 5,000 people, um, shows that about 40% of people don't feel um, that they have uh, in, any influence of, uh, about council decision making. Um, so we, we've been proposing a number of practical measures within the council in terms of people engaging with the council. So things like pushing early consultation on the council budget and uh, really responding to, to, to what people say about the budget. Um, the webcasting of meetings, which is being um, uh, rolled out at the council. Um, the setting up of a petitions committee um, participatory budgeting has been um, pioneered in, in the Leith Ward in Edinburgh um, by one of our councillors, Councillor Chapman. Um, so we're doing what we can, and the council, to be fair, is also setting up uh, the, the coalition. Um, they're very keen on the cooperative approach, um, and a, a number of projects in, in key areas, energy, um, uh, adult uh, care and um, housing to try to bring forward cooperative models um, working with the community. But um, having said all that, you know, I, I, I feel that there is probably a limit to what you can do with existing structures. Um, you know, we have neighbourhood partnerships, we have community councils. Community councils in Edinburgh involve um, 540 or so people. Um, that's a fairly small amount of people, and the key thing is that out of those 43 councils that we have, community councils that we have, there were only elections in three cases. In other words, there's not, in, there's not enough interest locally to create enough demand for places in the community council for people to, for there to be an election. Um, so as I come back to, I think um, that there may be a need to do something um, 
yes, we can um, reform existing local government and improve it, but there may be a need to actually um, directly devolve down powers to uh, smaller units that are closer to people uh, and take decisions that actually you know, affect their lives. And then you, if people see that there are smaller uh, units of local government they can engage with, that they can actually make a difference um, to what happens in their area, then uh, we'll, we'll see uh, you know, more participation. So at the moment, I mean, I, I totally get your point about a nice chat with councillors. I mean, I think for many people, they can seem, they can feel very isolated from what goes on in local government. Uh, yeah, um, I, mean, I take on board the point entirely that people will tend to engage when there is something that directly affects them. I mean, uh, two school closure proposals in my constituency and very well attended meetings regarding those, but many of those people will have engaged with that agenda only and, and will not take further involvement in community uh, aspects affecting their community. But in terms of community councils, I mean, there's been talk about devolving budgets down. It's worth remembering community councils do currently have budgets. They're probably they're not very substantial, but they do have money that they can use to make small improvements to their communities. But at the same time, if budgets were to be devolved to community councils, given the the democratic <coughs> deficiency, if you will, that exists where many community councils don't elect, many of them have fallen fallen away. Um, many of them are very unrepresentative of the community in terms of the fact that you know they, they maybe only come from a couple of streets within the area that they serve. How can we ensure that when budgets are, are, are devolved to that level, that community councils would be able to use them in a representative fashion? And is there a need maybe to look at reforming the structure of community councils, given that some of the evidence we've received is that uh, that has been largely untouched since the 1970s. I know I'm largely um, uh, going to lose this battle, but could you please be uh, brief? Because I, I do have a number of other questions that, that need to be brought to bear. Can we start, um, Councillor Burgess, this time first, please? I, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, if, if I want to get a, 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 a huge attendance at a meeting in my ward, uh, we'd have it on parking controls, and you will see hundreds of people turning out for that um, because it's an issue that's going to affect them directly. But just, um, you know, in, t in terms of community councils, yes, um, I, you know, I think um, there's a perception about community councils uh, at the moment and um, perception and practice, and it may be that we have to have something different, just, you know, um, something... Um, it's called something different for, for a start. And then, um, yes, the structure... Um, perhaps um, need to, to find a way to make um, the community councils more representative of, of the community in general. Um, yes, short answer. I think we undoubtedly have to look at uh, community councils if, if we're serious about this. But that's as much about... Um, Hand in, having uh, the, the idea of devolving budgets hand in hand with building community capacity and also realising that community councils aren't the only uh, structure at local level who are capable of making these kinds of decisions. Yes, sir. Mara, please. Yes. I totally agree with you and, and I would like to see a reform uh, and uh, uh, partnership working we've spoken about. I'm a big fan of partnership working and one of the partners in this is our community. And it's not about the great and the good in the community either. It's, it's predominantly those who are less well off that are uh, the ones who need the services more. So I think we have to engage an awful lot more. And it's community capacity that we need to be building up. I think if you give um, community councils limited local powers, then people will come. It will just happen. People will turn them because they have an interest. Talking about budgets, one of my, local, one of my community councils managed to acquire £180,000 from a local house builder, which required planning permission and et cetera, et cetera. So they actually had £180,000, which is a huge budget, and this money has been spent in the locality, grants for this, that, et cetera, and now a sports complex. So th they can do it. They can do it. They just need a bit more power. Thank you. Thanks for your brevity there. Yes. Anne McTaggart, please. Yeah, I, will, I will be <coughs> short and sweet because I think... Um, what I'm about to ask has been largely answered. Councillor Burgess had mentioned earlier about the fiscal um, autonomy for local governments. And yes, I had Andy White also speaks about, you know, in the UK, 12.7 of local government revenue. And in Scotland, only it's 10.7 10 .7 of the revenues. 
if we did, um, if we are able, what changes um, should be made to the current level of financial autonomy um, for local authorities? Now, I could hazard a guess at, you had mentioned earlier on about, I know we're not allowed to call it bed tax, it's tourist tax or whatever it's called now, um, and whatever, guys. But um, things like local income tax, land and property tax, sales tax, visitor levies, what is our feeling around that? Um, we'll go from Councillor Roberts uh, to the, the left. Well, Roberts first. I think if you start introducing dif different and additional taxation, then you're going to make people move from perhaps one local authority area to another. That's the great danger, I would say. Um, I think we can, certainly in Perth and Ross, which is in the expanding community, we can uh, recover quite a bit of cash from developers' contributions, house building, etc. Although whether, whether the, the climate is still there for that, I don't know. But that's what we are looking to. We are looking to recover something like nine million, nine million. £10 million pounds over the next 10 years from developers' contributions. So that is perhaps one source of income that would not have the, the, you know, the, the effect that additional taxation or general taxation, whether it's on, on bedrooms or whatever it's called, um, to move people from one local authority area to another. Councillor McNamara. I think any um, elected body has to have the, uh, the ability to raise finance. And, and at this minute in time, we don't have that ability. In fact, it has diminished. And uh, the difficulty we have with um, council tax is because it's been flat cash over a period of time, there is a, a, the deficit now to make it up would be politically a nightmare. Uh, so the, there were proposals previously about local income tax, etc., etc. And I'm not a, a, a mathematician, but I can tell you it, it will not be whatever you come down to will not be popular. The, the ultimate aim of what we should be talking about is providing a service to the community and they have to welcome that opportunity for better schools, better housing, whatever. Uh, so at this minute in time, um, I'm not prepared to say what, what kind of taxation, but we should have the ability to be able to raise finances and be held accountable for that. Mr Aitken? Um, yeah, I would agree to a, a significant statement what Councillor McNamara said there. That, uh, there are obviously there are a number of options available. Uh, some have been explored in the past uh, and, and for whatever reason uh, not sort of come to fruition and not been taken through. I have no doubt that it's something that will be returned to. The, the, the issue just now is, um, and it, it's, um, it's, it's why the council tax freeze was, was brought in, obviously, with, with uh, the majority support. Um, and it's, I, I was reading... Um, Glasgow's uh, submission to this earlier, and I, I did think it was slightly odd that it had to go at the council tax fees because it was it was the first item in the administration's uh, uh, manifesto for election. So, uh, you know, the, there's uh, there is general agreement that that this is not the right time to be uh, raising people's uh, household bills. Um, as time moves on and perhaps we start to see a change uh, or a, an improvement um, in the economic situation, then I've no doubt that, that the, the question of, um, of local government income raising uh, will, will definitely be returned to. Uh, yes, um, the, the current strictures are uh, they're not sustainable in, in, in the longer term. Uh, in terms of the, the kind of things that we're aspiring to, of talking about autonomy and flexibility within local government. But uh, the, the, the current council tax fees that everyone is, the, the majority um, of the kind of body politic in Scotland, if you like, are, are signed up to, is clearly the right policy for, for, for just now. But in um, perhaps following uh, the, or round about the time of, of the next local government elections, another serious look at the various options like land value tax, like local income tax, and even whether individual local authorities uh, could could make their choices uh, from a menu of, of what are the best forms of, of local taxation for them to suit, suit their circumstances best might well be something that um, the parliament and uh, COSLA and, and uh, local government uh, in Scotland would want to explore in more detail. Mr Burgess, please. Although I was saying earlier that keen to see the, the council tax freeze re re removed, um, uh, 
our party isn't actually very supportive of the council tax, like a lot of other parties, and we favour land value taxation um, uh, as a, an alternative um, to, to the council tax. Um, just to say, um, and we also would like to see things like the transient visitor levy um, uh, uh, also um, uh, given to local government to have a, a say over. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but uh, at the moment, the only flexibility that councils uh, have um, are over fees and charges. And in Edinburgh, we've seen fees and charges grow to half, just under half that raised through the council tax. And of course, fees and charges um, in themselves are controlled in, in terms of uh, you know, what you can raise uh, fees and charges on is, is, is controlled by central government. Um, but the other point about them is that they're regressive, that they don't, um, they're not uh, set in relation to people's uh, you know, a wealth or ability to pay. So I feel that that's a pretty unhealthy situation at the moment and uh, would like to see that um, unlocked. Alec Rowley, please. I wonder if, when we talk about community impairment and budgets, are we talking on the margins? Because you know, the day-to-day decision-making within local government, the overwhelming majority of decisions that are taken impact on people's lives will be taken by the professionals. If you look at the education budget, it makes up 45-48% of a local authority budget and is spent, in the main, in local schools, so arguably, could you go much lower? And how would you, who would you involve in that? If you add social work, both the children and families and the older people services to that, it can take the, the local authority budget up to nearer 80%. And, and therefore, you know, those are being made by professional decisions. Sometimes this discussion this morning, you would think that, that councillors are making all these decisions, but actually, they're not. It's professionals that are making decisions on the overwhelming but the local authority budget. And back to the point you made about the, the Tesco, the analogy with Tesco, um, I would say that I wouldn't necessarily disagree that what people are looking for at the end of the day is if somebody's stuck in a hospital and can't get out because there's not the money in place to actually put the home care package in place or buy them a, a place in a care home, then, and again, it's the professionals that's making those decisions. So, you know, are we talking about the margins here? Okay. Let's start with Councillor Burgess this time, please. Um, I think um, right in that um, you know, the vast majority of a council budget is already earmarked for essential um, services and, and essential infrastructure. And when we come to set our budget, you know, 99% um, of the budget is there. And and actually now with you know increasing um, you know budget demands and uh, a relatively um, smaller budget in real terms year on year, there's actually very little room for um, councillors to um, be creative about you know, new, new policy in that sense. Um, although I would say we do still have to, we uh, approve that spending, you know, uh, the, the recommendations by officers on, on uh, the provision of, of services, so we still have a very important role there. Um, I think as you devolve down power to smaller units of local government, um, clearly there will be things that it, it, it would be important for those um, for there to be collaboration around to, to maintain services. Um, uh, but there are still quite a lot of um, uh, services and, and, and activities that could be devolved down to um, you know, local communities. Um, so I think you know, there is scope there. Um, in terms of what proportion of the budget, um, not uh, absolutely uh, fixed on that. But we, our party, certainly in ter terms of participatory budgeting, we had a figure of 1% um, of the budget of the council budget as being an initial target um, to devolve down to, 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 uh, to existing um, uh, local structures t to make decisions over. Thank you, please. Um, yes, of course you're right that officers are, are making the decisions about, about the you know um, the day-to-day -day spending of, of the big budgets, although one would hope with a strategic direction set for them by by the political administration um, that, that's been elected. Um, 
And so when it does come to community budgeting, you're talking about small sums of money, but sometimes the margins are what makes the difference. Um, and, and I would come back to the likes of, of, of the Community Empowerment Bill and Asset Transfer, for example. Um, if you're living in a community and there is a, a disused council building uh, at you know, a closed school or something, which has become a magnet for graffiti or for antisocial behaviour, teenage drinking, uh, on, or, or is just an eyesore. And the community is empowered to do something about that, to take over that asset and transform it. Um, that might be a marginal change, but it's a change that could, could make a significant difference to that community's sense of itself and its well-being um, and, and the individuals who live within it. So, um, yes, you're right, in the overall scheme of things, we're not talking about um, the big bucks in terms of local government budgets, but equally we shouldn't underestimate what we're capable of achieving if, if we seriously embrace the community empowerment agenda. Thanks, Chair. Um the crash in 2008, prior to that, as a local authority, we did make the decisions. Politically, we introduced minimum wage, we introduced classroom assistance, we uh, doubled the number of apprentices, we gave direction to the council. These were our political priorities. Sadly, since then, uh, uh, we've had to sit down year on year and cut the budget. Now, nobody wants to cut the budget, so you look for the best options possible with the minimum impact on the community you represent. More recently, what we've been trying to do is to go into the community, and I find this rather, uh, uh, you know, a bit odd that the time when we go to cut the budget, we take it out to the community to explain to them why we're cutting, but we didn't ever go to them and say to them, by the way, we're spending money on minimum wage or apprentices. We got elected to do that, but now we're taking the budget out and saying, this is a difficulty we are facing. We are facing £60 million. Pounds. Well, this, we've already reduced £40 million. Pounds. We've got another £25 million to find, and how, in God, goodness knows, where we're going to get that. So, of course, we rely on the professionals to come forward, but they will obviously have to reflect the political need of the council. They will know what will be acceptable and what will not be acceptable. Sadly, we're getting to the point where nothing is acceptable. That's the difficulty. Well, we've got a statute of duty, so we've got to fund them. And by the time you take take the total the, the, the total cost of all of these, you, you, you've only left with maybe ten percent of your budget, which is you might call slightly flexible. And that, because of the cuts that we're facing, and we have faced, and there are more to come, that's the area where we have to make the cuts. We can't close secondary schools. We we can't stop community care. We have to do that. Um, so this, that's where the cuts come. And when you come to cutting grass or play parks. Um, public toilets and so on. These are the things, our public libraries, that is where we are having to, to, we will have to make our future cuts and we're making them already. And that really hits people. They, they, they're the sort of things that get people up in arms and, and get them forming uh, interest groups. But it, it, it's overall funding and the fact that we are fixed, we, our funding, our expenditure is, is so fixed, so much of our expenditure is fixed, there's very little flexibility anywhere else. This is where I'm trying to come to. It's not to undermine the policy direction that councillors set. Um, it is the key question around finance. And really, what I would suggest to you is that unless we actually start to, to look at how local government is financed, then that margin is going to be even less because we have demographics, the health and social care partnership, you're bringing two partners together, both in massive overspends, um, almost setting it up to fail if it's not financed properly. And that, that really, I think, you know, what's, what's come across here is very little in oral evidence of what local government's view is in terms of how to be financed for the future. And I would suggest to you that, that times are going to be even tougher over the next few years, and local government's voice needs to be talking about, you know, how it's properly financed. We make savings, but eventually we've got to the stage now where we can't make any more efficiency savings than what we deliver. So we then have to start cutting back on services, and of course we've been asked to do more with less. Yeah, I think we tried to explain it earlier. I do agree with you. Finance is crucial uh, politically and for all the services. So I think you're absolutely right. We have to look at local government finance seriously. 
Uh, but to go back to your other point about the Health and Social Care Partnership, I would disagree with you that it's set up to fail. I think what we've got here is two massive budgets which could be used an awful lot better. I am on our Health and Social Care Partnership and I want to use the money an awful lot better rather than having people bed blocking or lock, you know, whatever. The facility should be at home for them to be able to go home and be properly cared for. But we need to put the services in place. And we also need to change the culture in both of those monolithic organisations, local government and the NHS. So I think that a change agenda is something else that we should embrace. And in order to try and save money, we have tried to embrace the change agenda. But what I'm trying to say to you is, We've got to put the bones now, you know, we're, we're not cutting the fat off anymore, and that's the frightening thing. Uh, and politically, we will waken up to this, both at national level and at local government level, to our peril, I have to say, you know, because we will be doing s stuff which is totally unpalatable. Can I ask um, the two remaining uh, who have yet to answer can, can maybe go on this as well? How has um, Perth and Kinross or, or North Ayrshire? Um, carried out zero-based budgeting exercises or priority-based budgeting exercises at all? Um, and has there been any discussion about what is a statutory service and what is not? Because, again, this comes down to, to interpretation often by officers. Well, I know, I'm not Sorry, Chair, but yeah. I, I know that, for example, in education, we have a statutory responsibility to educate, but we don't have a statutory responsibility to have schools. So, I mean, there is, therein lies the dilemma. So I, I don't like to get into what's statutory and what's not. I, I like to get into the fact of what is best for the community and what do they expect to receive. I'm a bit of gumption, I think, Mr uh, Councillor McNamara. I think we just perceive what statutory duties are, such as educating children, providing housing and providing community care. We don't actually look at the legislation in mi microscopic detail to see what we could get away with not doing. Zero-based budget and exercises. Has there been one in Perth? No. No. Has there been one in North Ayrshire? Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, Councillor Aitken. Um, I think uh, you're absolutely right, and I agree with what Councillor McNamara said. Yes. Um, the, the future financing of local government um, is, is something that has to be looked at very seriously. I don't think there's a clear consensus or a clear view in local government just now at all about, about what that should be, what that future is. Um, I think the, the, the recent discussions around budget at COSLA, for example, have thrown up all sorts of different views, um, even just around the, the funding formula about, about how that should go forward. Um, in actual fact, the leader of my own council, even at a, the, I think the last COSLA leaders meeting, suggested that COSLA had just hand it all over to, to the finance secretary and not have any control over over uh, the, the, the formula um, at all, which, um, I'm, to be fair, I don't think he got an enormous amount of support for. But um, So there isn't a clear consensus just now, and there, there obviously does have to be um, some serious discussion across local government, but also with... Uh, with with you all as as um, members of the Scottish Parliament of of our national Parliament and with the Scottish Government as well um, about about the best way forward on this, there are a number of options available to us, and and um, I'm not sure all of them have have been explored um, in in the depth um, that. The, the, the require to be for us for us to come to a decision about what's what's the best one, um, and in response to, to to what you're asking, convener, I mean, certainly in Glasgow there, there are um, serious discussions about what is and what is not a statutory service, um, and I would say in, in social work particularly, which happens to be the service I'm most familiar with, but also in in land and environmental services. Um, a lot of the, the drive behind the, the cooperative council idea is, is to do with that, actually, um, about trying to, um, to get uh, individuals and communities to think about what they would do and what they can do for themselves rather than relying on the council to do it for them. Um, so that there's definitely discussion around that just now. A zero-based or priority-based budgeting exercise across the council, has there been one? Um, no, I don't know that I'm aware of. Okay. Councillor Burgess. Um, so there hasn't been a, a zero-based budgeting um, exercise in Edinburgh, but um, uh, you know, faced with the um, the fiscal challenges and financial challenges, um, the council has recently um, instigated what they call bold, better outcomes, leaner delivery, and um, the council is setting about looking at what it absolutely um, you know has to provide in terms of outcomes. Uh, and trying to get some focus on that. Um, and 
that will be used to direct um, council spending um, in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Convener. Good morning. I start off my questions uh, to Councillor McNamara and Councillor Roberts. And I should say, Councillor McNamara, you made a comment, you made two comments actually about the minimum wage. I hope North Ayrshire has been paying the minimum wage since 1999, or you might have a queue of workers. I thought it was a living wage, but you did say the minimum wage. I just wanted to get that clarified. Could I ask Councillor McNamara or Councillor Roberts, have you served on a majority administration or a coalition administration? I know the answer in terms is uh, Councillor Burgess and Councillor Aiken, but I'd be interested uh, from Councillor Roberts and Councillor McNamara's point of view. And whether or not the impact, or you've seen any clear impact in terms of the decision making within the council and your engagement within the decision making process? Councillor McNamara, do you want to go first, please? Um, yes, I have served on a, a majority um, council. Um, sorry, your second part of your question is to find out whether or not you've, what your view is or your perception of the decision making in process. terms in the process. Because what I've heard this morning, and my perception of what I've heard from the four uh, panel members this morning, is everything seems to be working fine in the local authorities. It seems to be very decision making seems to be very consensual. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any disputes regarding how the majority or coalition administration uh, decides how the budgets are spent, because my interpretation is that you all seem to be fully engaged, fully involved in the decision-making process. And I would have heard, expected to hear the same answers from four council leaders if they were sitting in front of us today, uh, giving the evidence to the questions that have been asked so far. So the question is really, do you see a difference in terms of or your perception of the, how the decision-making process operates from being in the, the, in the administration to being in the opposition? I think from my, my own experience, the, the biggest difference is um, not being engaged earlier. Uh, when we were in the administration, you, you were engaged with officers earlier and they constructed things around what you would say politically. Uh, when you're in the opposition, uh, you have to await that decision because you are not in the position of influence and in, in, in the direction of travel of the council. And I think from uh, my perspective, I've been on the council since 88 um, and I'm used to being in the administration in whatever term or whatever position. Uh, and it became very difficult, I have to say, to be on the other side of the, the, the bench and to await um, and, and try to formulate an argument against uh, but it's something that we, we, we are coming to terms with. Um, in fact, I think this will be the first time in an opposition position that we are actually asking finance officers to come and talk to us prior to the budget setting process so that we can uh, influence and bring in our tuppence worth, if you like, prior to the budget being placed before us. I think that will be the first time that we've done that. Yes, sir, Robert. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, my council, Perth and Kinross, is currently run by uh, a minority administration who require our support. Uh, we work with them on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. We see all the pre-agendas and we have weekly meetings with the administration to go over the papers coming up before the council. Um, sometimes things have to be withdrawn. And on occasions, we have actually actively voted against the administration uh, to get what we particularly wanted. As far as budgets go, the budget process, all the, 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 the council groups have the, the use of an officer who goes over the options that are available, and we all draft our own budgets, um, they usually end up in a very similar manner because we're given the fixed... <laughs> these are your fixed costs, and here are the options for savings and for perhaps for additional expenditure. Um, so we are well informed of the, the, the process and everything that is actually happening, particularly financial. And when it comes to budgets, we, we are extremely well informed and we know exactly what's happening on budget day. I appreciate those responses, particularly Councillor McNamara's position of being one being in the administration and then not being in the administration and the, the information that's then supplied uh, from the administration and to allow you to fully engage and understand Councillor Roberts position in terms of assisting a, a minority administration. One of the issues is, do you think, and this, this can include Councillor Burgess and Councillor Aiken, do you think administrations, council administrations, 
provide enough information early enough, not only for the opposition council groups, but for communities to become fully engaged in the budget setting process. Because we hear, we have heard in this committee uh, recently that some local authorities will say, we consult communities, but it's at what stage do they start consulting the communities? Is it once the decisions have been made, or is it once the, or the, or the majority administration has made a decision, or is it uh, prior to that, and do you think there is enough consultation takes place? We'll go left to right. Uh, Councillor Burgess first, please. When I, uh, when I joined the Council in 2007, um, the budget practice was that um, uh, <clears throat> the administration would present their budget on budget day, and that was the first time that you saw it. Um, it was, uh, there would be a recommendation from officers um, a few months in advance, um, but that was it. The budget process has improved greatly, um, and um, I'd like to think that we were part pushing for that um, in our group. And now um, the council leader is committed to publishing the budget. Well, the last budget was published in September ahead of the February decision, so five months. And that includes consultation with, um, with the community. Um, so we get presented with um, the, it's the officers' recommendations that have been um, approved for draft by the coalition uh, that we get to see, and then we uh, can base our own budget on that. We are given uh, as much support as we want. We're assigned uh, an officer um, to help us bring forward our own budget proposal. So things are getting better. and we're, We also have um, pre-budget day discussions with um, uh, the finance convener and deputy. Um, and um, now we're beginning to see um, some minor concessions where some of the things that we propose on budget day are accepted by um, the coalition, although, you know, that is very small at the moment. We're talking about, you know, 100 to 200,000 pounds worth of, um, you know, policy. Um, but um, uh, I think one of the problems we've had in, in is accessing enough level a detailed level of information to determine what departments are actually spending on and therefore what we could propose changes to and I think um, that's one criticism we still have we still don't get enough detail about departmental spending that would allow us to propose um, more change um. thanks um, I mean, I would say I think the questions up until now have primarily been about budgeting at, at neighbourhood level. Um, in terms of the, the overall budget setting process, um, obviously we, we have um, we have some very serious concerns about about the way that it's handled in in uh, in, in my council. Um, having said that. Uh, I know that, that um, certainly um, the most recent budget in Glasgow was a was a two year process a two year budget, um, so there was it was a much more um, minimal process this year. But for for last year when when the budget was set, um, the finance spokesperson from our group engaged at length with with officers. And I, I, as I believe, in fact, the, the Green Group in, in, on the Council did as well um, and, and drew up our budget proposals, our, our amendments to the administration's budget on the basis of that. Uh, so there was sharing of information. Um, I would say that, that was, uh, it was sought by us, by, by the SNP group, to a certain extent. And in fact, we made a decision in the group that we would, we would make the offer to the administration that where we could work with them um, and find areas of agreement, we would do so and that we would seek to amend uh, where, where we had serious concerns. Um, and, and that was what happened. Um, in terms of, um, are, is that information made available to communities at, at a macro uh, level of, of budget setting? Uh, no, it's not. And I mean, I think I, I made clear earlier that uh, the, the aspirations and, and, and the... Uh, the, the talk uh, around uh, community involvement, I think there, there is consensus about um, within the council across the political spectrum. Our, our differences would be between uh, would be about about the speed and and the the, the depth of, of how that's being taken forward, perhaps. Um, but 
I think it's absolutely clear that, that those aspirations are nowhere near being fulfilled in Glasgow and in some cases are still talk um, and, and aren't, aren't uh, close to it at all. And um, our group certainly has some very serious concerns about the way that decisions uh, are made within, within the, the council and, and the, the process that that takes place. Yeah, um, as far as communicating the budget um, externally, we, we have a straight talking events that go on and it started in the previous administration. But like you say, it's not down to the micro part of the budget. It's about a generalisation on here's the amount of money we've got, here's what we've got to find, here are areas that we're looking at. Uh, but on a political level, we are a lot smaller than Glasgow and Edinburgh, so I can meet with the leader of the uh, the uh, council uh, and say, here's my uh, areas of concern, and we, we can uh, uh, discuss that and hopefully take the budget forward in a, a consensual way that uh, hasn't happened in the past. Uh, that uh, has been uh, my experience so far. The budget protest takes some three months before actual budget day to go over all the figures and then dig down deep and see what they all mean. But the budget is not revealed to anybody um, until budget day, when each party puts forward the budget, so that's if the party does put forward a budget. And then there's uh, a bit of wrangling in council to decide eventually, because it is a, it, it, there's, it's a minority administration, so they have to carry other parties. There is a wrangle in council to get a final budget. But as far as communities are concerned, they are not consulted before before the budget, the budget day, they have no idea really what's coming forward. Their only input into the budget process is basically through their councillors, who should actually know the interests of their areas and push forward anything that can be put into the budget to benefit their own wards. Thank you. One final question, Commissioner. Yes, we, we spoke about, uh, or some members spoke about a written constitution for local government. Should that written constitution contain the duties that would be expected of a local uh, government body to deliver. And what I mean by that, at the present moment, we talked about statutory duties, and we know that some local authorities have other duties that they carry out. <coughs> they make the decision on that. What should be contained within that right constitution? Okay, Sir Burgess. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't like to determine that here and now. I think that would be my answer. Um, certainly, there would be scope to um, to contain duties and therefore to um, protect the responsibility um, of local government to, to you know to, to deliver on those um, duties. Um, yes, I think probably should what they are. Um, I would like to answer that at the moment. Thank you. Um, I, I think that uh, what should be in the constitution is perhaps rather more around the principles of what we believe local government to be, what it's for. Uh, I think if we start to get down to detailing uh, specific duties in the constitution, um, then we perhaps leave ourselves open to uh, then having difficulties in expanding those duties in future, for example, uh, or changing those duties or altering those duties. Um, but that might be something for a, a constitutional amendment process for a future Scottish Supreme Court to take on. That. <laughs> yeah, please follow that. Um, <laughs> can I say that, that uh, for me, a constitution would be a contract, and that would be a contract between uh, the community and the local authority and uh, uh, the uh, parliament, uh, and we would be obliged to fulfil that contract. What is in the contract is something I believe we still have to discuss, and I have already indicated there are uh, uh, some areas that I would definitely not like to lose, and there are some which I would like to get back. So basically you're saying we make all our duties statutory duties, which gives no flexibility to, to individual councillors, but what, what suits Glasgow doesn't necessarily suit Perthshire, so we would have no way of, of, of discerning. We wouldn't be able to deliver the services that our particular councils need. And that leads me on to a final question in terms of the flexibility. Um, we've been to the, the islands recently to hear evidence from them uh, about their circumstances. Um, we have two councillors um, from uh, cities here today, um, two councillors from rural-ish but with uh, quite large towns uh, in them. Um, do you think that uniformity uh, works in local government or do you actually need that flexibility to take into account your own circumstances uh, in your own areas? And in terms of that flexibility, what could be put in place in your areas 
to improve that situation. Uh, Councillor Roberts. I'd just like to say Perth is a city, by the way, not a town. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I, I, I keep forgetting about the six cities scenario, <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Roberts, and I, I'll go and slap myself in the fingers after this, I think. You're right. What, what suits Perth city does not necessarily suit Perth rural. So we have to have flexibility in how we deliver our services. That's all I can say. Sir yeah. McNamara? Uh, yeah, I, I always agree with that because uh, in my ward actually takes in Adrosan and Arran, two totally diverse communities. And um, uh, you, you even have to talk differently when you're on the island as opposed to talking differently on the mainland. So flexibility is crucial to take forward because ultimately what we want to do is reflect the community and what their requirements are. So, yes. North Ayrshire, do you know, engaged with um, Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles uh, round about our islands, our future, because of the Arran situation? Well, as I'm in the minority on North Ayrshire Council, I'll have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Aitken. Um, yeah, and I think uniformity in local government is a contradiction in terms. Um, what we should be looking for, perhaps, is, is achieving consistency and quality of delivery of service, but the way that services are delivered um, is, is, must be flexible and must be open to, to local circumstances because they're, they're so varied across, uh, not just across Scotland, but within council areas, particularly the larger ones. Councillor Burgess, please. Um, I think I would support flexibility in local government. Um, the paper by Andy Whiteman actually suggests the Lego brick model, um, where municipalities, smaller municipalities, can come together in different combinations, um, and that would provide um, a large degree of, of, of flexibility. Um, very much. Can I thank you all for your evidence today? Um, a lengthy session, but uh, I think uh, the length of time that this has taken shows how worthwhile uh, your evidence has been to the, the committee this morning. Uh, I now suspend and we move into private session.